some of you 2022 was a was a year that could not be finished quick enough and uh, you look you're looking at 2023 and you're looking at a, a new year and you're hoping that it turns out better than the last year and that's okay uh, there are some years uh, that when we as as we follow Jesus they're just going to be tough and sometimes long and hard do you know why it doesn't have it doesn't have anything to do uh, with Jesus making it that way now he may allow it that way because he he has, uh, he has a will for those things. He has a purpose for those things in your life. But I will say this this morning, uh, it's just because that's what life is. So there are times that life is tough. Uh, we, live in a, we live in a world that while God is sovereign and God is in control, uh, because of sin, there still is another little G-O-D working in this world, and that's the devil. The Bible calls him the God of this world, the one uh, that this world lets run the show, if you will. Now God's behind the scene pulling the strings and letting everything just fall right into the plan that he had from the beginning. Uh, but there is uh, there is a, a being that mankind lets be in the forefront in this world and that's the devil. We, we follow the flesh and the devil a whole lot more than we follow God. Amen. I'm telling you this morning we have a God that's big enough and able enough to handle anything that we'll face this year. And I'm telling you even if it even if 2023 does become a hard year, there's a enough grace and mercy from the Lord uh, to get you through it and sustain you even in difficult days. Amen. You know how I know? Because we just came through 2022 and you're here this morning. Amen. You're still here. You're in the house of God. God even in all the pain, turmoil, stress and grief has brought you here this morning and I give God praise and glory for that. Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning please to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter number 3 this morning morning. Philippians chapter number three this morning. <clears throat> and I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead and let you know, uh, I'm not sure how much of this I'm going to get in this service. There may be a part of this service where we just essentially have a year in review. We'll see what God does. Uh, but I want us to look here in this passage of Scripture together and uh, see the thoughts that the Lord uh, has given us for these days. Philippians chapter number 3, if you're physically able, I invite you to stand as we honor and reverence the reading of the Word of God together this morning. Let's look at verse number 13 this morning. And uh, we'll, we'll back up to verse number 12. Well, let, let's do this. Let's back up to verse number 1. We'll just read for the context. Not, a very, not very long. But let's back up to verse number 1. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write these the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have, have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection... Hallelujah goes right there. Amen. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. <clears throat> if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, 
but I follow after, if that I may at, uh, apprehend that for which I, uh, that that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus, brethren. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You may, we'll conclude our reading there. You may take a seat. Let's bow for a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the message that the Lord would have for us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence this morning. Lord, my heart is already stirred by the Word of God. Oh, how my heart desires for the reality of this truth to be the reality in my life, in the life of my family, and in the life of Beacon Baptist Church this year in 2023. Lord, I beg you, dear God, would you please help me, Lord, as I try to preach the Word of God. Lord, there's many things that you've placed on my heart to say. And Lord God, I want to get to what you'd have for us to say. But Lord, I want to follow your leadership and stir the hearts of this congregation of people to desire what Paul said in these verses that he desires, Lord, in his life. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would take the truth of these verses and make them come alive to us this morning. And Lord, as we may visit this passage of Scripture tonight and maybe even in other weeks, Lord, I just pray that this truth would come alive. May it burn in our hearts. May we understand it and may we apply it to our lives. Lord, may it set the right kind of precedent for the year. And Lord God, put a hunger and a, and a thirst and a, and a desire in our heart, Lord, for what is described in these verses. Lord, I pray, dear God, that as I preach, that you would help me to preach not only about what a joy it is to be a Christian and what God has given for us and what God is saying to us, Lord, that are saved, but I pray, dear God, that, as no, that, Lord, that no message I'd ever preach would be void of the gospel, would be void of telling people how good you are, and, Lord, that you died to save them and that you can save their soul and take them to heaven, Lord God, and to, Lord, prevent them from an eternity in hell. Lord, I just pray the gospel would go forth in power. Lord God, that you would be exalted, that you'd be pleased, that you'd be worshipped and honored and adored. Lord, that I would lift up your name. Lord, as high as I can lift it up in this body of flesh. And I pray, dear God, that you would help us all to worship you in spirit and in truth. Even during preaching, I pray, God, that you'd help us to worship. Lord, teach us the Word of God. Preach us that challenge that we need. And Lord, I pray, dear God, for these next few moments that it would be everything, God, that you would have for it to be. Minister to hearts, save souls, change lives, touch the heart of a backslider. Help them, Lord, to see their need of being closer to you. And Lord, right with you, and may you touch and feed every Christian with the truth of the Word of God this morning. I don't have anything to offer them, Lord, but I know you do. And I pray, dear God, that you would give them what they stand in need of today and what we'll stand in need of this year. Lord, in, the, in this service, I pray, may it be the right uh, Lord, uh, may it be the right thought. May it be the, the right uh, presentation. May we be stirred, Lord, as never before. And may it be exactly what we need as we begin 2023. And Father, I'll thank you, Lord, for what you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. We come to these verses this morning. I'm, I'm going to do something that is a little bit different than my normal style of preaching. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about these verses that we've read this morning uh, just briefly. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit from the heart of a pastor to a church, to his church, that God's let me be the over-shepherd of. And then uh, after we do that, if we have time, then we'll take the text that I've presented and we will preach 
preach through these verses this morning uh, as the Lord allows us with the time that we have. But when we come to the book of Philippians, of course, we come to a very short book of the Bible. It is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to uh, the Philippians, as, as the name tells us, those that were believers in Philippi, that church there in Philippi. He gives us these chapters, and the central focus of the book of Philippians is rejoicing. It is joy, uh, having joy in the Lord. And when you read the book of Philippians, it's hard not not to uh, see and to find reasons to rejoice in the wall, in the life that God has given us through Christ. When we come to this third chapter, uh, the Bible here gives us uh, some final words that the Apostle Paul is going to write, and he begins in chapter number three with the word "finally," and uh, the, he is, according to that word, we know how we use it finally. We say this is the last thing that we are going to give. But in the Bible, that's not always the case. Uh, because Paul will say finally again in chapter number 4 and verse number 8. And when he says finally there, he is giving the last truth that he'll give in this letter. When he says finally here, what he is telling this group of Philippians is, is that I have more on my heart that I'm going to add to what I have already said in those first two chapters. And I will say this this morning. You go back on your own time and read the book of Philippians. It wouldn't take you just a few minutes to read the entire book. Uh, Philippians chapter number 1 and Philippians chapter number 2 are two loaded chapters of the Word of God. Uh, and we have find plenty of reasons to rejoice uh, there. Now that's not to say that the last two chapters as well are not equally as loaded. They are. Uh, each chapter there are verses that we... Uh, we mention time and time again and that are the Christian's favorite verses. And in the book of Philippians we find many verses that you can hang your life upon and use as a life verse and use as a charge for the direction of your life. Paul here in a condensed form, in a very small letter, has given to us truth that we so desperately need. And as you go from one verse to the next it's one vital life changing truth for the Christian after the other. The Apostle Paul here when he comes to chapter number 3 is giving us uh, these additional things that uh, is upon his heart and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But he begins to talk with us in these verses about uh, how he views these believers. How they should view themselves. How he looks at his life in, in the rear view mirror if you will and he looks at the past of his life and how the past of his life bears uh, upon the uh, present stage of his life. And is that not the way we are? Amen. Uh, your past is what brought you here. Uh, you know, you we often have folks ask the question, well, if you could change something in your past, what would you change? And the fact of the matter is, as much as we would love to fix past mistakes, if you are where you are today and you, uh, God is moving in your life and blessing your life. Very, if we could change something that happened in the past it may completely have altered the trajectory of your life to where you would not be here this morning. You would not be serving God. You would not be uh, listening to preaching. You'd be surprised how one decision in your life, one, uh, one change in your life could completely change how the rest of your life was going to go. I'm thankful. While, while there's some things I want to change I will say I'm thankful we God's gotten me in my life today. Amen. He's been good. He's been faithful. He's been a blessing to me. He's blessed my family more than I could ever uh, dream. Amen. Church, you've blessed my family. It's been a joy these last uh, soon to be five years to be your pastor. I'm happy and thankful for where God has us in life. And I'm not interested in changing it. Amen. Because that which I may change, try to change for the better, it may remove some of the greatest blessings that I've ever had in my life. Here we talk about 
change that we would make in life. But Paul is saying that it was the events of his past that have brought him to the spiritual thoughts, the spiritual attitudes that he says he now possesses in his life. He uses his past to be the catalyst to which he encourages these Philippian believers uh, to also embrace uh, the same thoughts and the same attitude uh, that he has toward his ministry and his service for the Lord as a Christian to adopt the same mind in the their own life and that God would bless them for it. With that being said, I want to take this morning uh, a thought and we will we'll use this in verse 13. Out of all of this chapter, if I could say that there was a central verse that describes the idea that Paul is trying to get across in this chapter of 21 verses, it's verse number 13. The Bible says in verse number 13, Paul writes, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind. And notice, he says, and notice these next two words, reaching forth unto those things which are before. If you remember about this time last year, I presented to you the vision that God had put in my heart for 2022 for our church. And that was a vision that I, I preached a message entitled, A Vision of Reaching. How we were to reach in as a congregation to the ministry of our local New Testament church to be more active and a more integral part of the church's ministry to the unsaved in our community and to those around the world uh, and uh, also to, uh, to reach into our church to fulfill the different ministries of our church that not only reach out to the lost but also equip the saved uh, to be the Christians that God would have for them to be. Uh, we talked about 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and how that passage of scripture says that the church is a body. It is the body of Christ and we each have a part and we each have a function. We each have uh, an ability and we each have attributes that make us the parts that this church needs to function reaching in. That, uh, that, that vision is there on those banners on the wall that have been there all year long reaching in. But then we also talked about how God would have for us to reach out. Uh, Jude uh, chapter 1 verse 20 through 25 uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the man Jude was telling us that we are to reach out to a lost and dying world. And if you remember, I said we are to do it compassionately. We are to do it comprehendingly. We are to do it carefully considering our own spiritual condition that we be the representatives of Christ. That we should be so that when we reach out to a lost and dying world, our lives do not contradict the message that we share. The Bible tells us that, that we are to reach in. That we are to reach out. But I've saved this last, this last part of last year's vision for this morning because it is the perfect catalyst to what I, the first perfect connection to where I feel like God would have for us to go this year. This year our vision statement is not reaching in, reaching out, reaching forth, but we do continue that vision of reaching. I put it in the bulletin several weeks ago. If you've looked at that for our vision month, our vision for the year is that we want to reach more before 2024. Reaching more before 2024. You and I as the body of Christ should always have reaching in our minds and in our hearts. When we are when we are saved and we become a member of a local church, uh, you become a part of like this church. Uh, many of you are members here. Some of you are praying about being members here. Some of you are visiting, looking for a church home and seeing if God wants you to be a part of this church. When you become a part of Beacon Baptist Church, there's a role for you to fill and your heart should be, I want to reach in to this ministry and I want to lay my hands on what God has for me. 
As a Christian, our heart's desire should be not only reaching in, but reaching out. That there's a lost and dying world out there that's never heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or they have, but they've rejected uh, for a multitude of reasons. But you and I should have in our heart to be the loving, uh, Christ-like individual that will go to someone where they are, love them where they are as Jesus would, and tell them that there's a God in heaven that loved them so much that he sent his, he sent his only son, he sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, into the world that was filled with sin to die on the cross of death under the wrath of God that all mankind deserves, be it Jesus paid for. Yes. There's not one person, as I mentioned this past, I believe it was Wednesday night, I'm not sure all my messages to me and my mind run together, all the days that they were preached. <laughs> I think it was Wednesday night that everyone is not saved, everyone, but everyone has the ability to be saved. There's not anyone in this building or anyone on this planet that has to die and go to hell. Right. Jesus paid the sin debt. Jesus paid the price that God demanded for access into heaven. If you'll just believe what he did on the cross, if you'll just trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you'll come before him saying, I know I'm not perfect, I know I'm a sinner, and I know you died to save me, and I'm calling upon you by faith. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died in my place. I believe you want to save me, and I want to be saved. God will do just that. Amen. Our job as believers is to let a world know that there's a God in heaven that loves them and wants to save them. However, according to these verses, it should not only be in the heart of a Christian to reach in. Paul mentioned that, 1 Corinthians 12. It's not only should be in the heart of, of a Christian to reach out. Jude mentioned that in Jude 20, verse uh, chapter, or, or excuse me, chapter 1, verse 20 through 25. But here in Philippians 3.13, the Apostle Paul says it should also be in the heart of every Christian to reach forth. To reach forth. Can I say this this morning? God wants us at Beacon Baptist Church as we have concluded 2022 and we enter into 2023, God wants us to not stop reaching in. He's not done with us doing that to the ministry here. He's not done with us reaching out. We know that. That's clear. But God wants us to take it a step further. And as we reach in, as we reach out, we must also reach forth. And reaching forth in itself in this phrase is a vision for the future. The Apostle Paul said it was in this verse. He lets us know that it was his vision for his life in the present and all of the days to come. Notice the Apostle so Paul does not say that he has reached forth in the past, but he is reaching forth. It's an active word. It's true now, and he desires for it to be true in the future. Every one of us should reach forth. Here's where I said I wanted to give some comments to you as, our, as your pastor as we look at the year God's given us. As I said, all of us still need to be, in our mind, we need to be concerned with reaching in. If you did all the reaching into the ministry that you're going to do last year, then that does not give bright hopes for the, our ministry as a church going forward into 2023. If you took 2022 as an opportunity, despite what I preached and what I challenged our church, if you took 2022 as an opportunity to pull your hands off of the ministry and become less engaged than you've ever been, then if we don't reach the potential that God has for us to reach, you're part of the problem. If we as a church, if we are the body of Christ, if we are his hands, if we are his feet, if we're going to reach what God wants us to reach for his glory, every member, every part has to be reaching for what God has for you to reach. You ought to be as the feet of God, of his body, if every one of us are not using what God has given us to go the places God for have, would have for us to go and reach the potential God would have for us to reach 2023. Three may not be as successful as 2022 was. Can I say this this morning? 
You may not, you may think so, or you may not think so, but there are still many areas in our church's ministry that could use your hand to reach in and touch it. Now, can I say this? And I'm thankful for this. Many of you took my challenge in January of 2022. You took it seriously. And you reached in. I'll say this this morning. Out of the, out of the soon to be five years that I've been the pastor here, 2022 was the year that I had the most help in the ministry here. I thank God for that. Because, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this as I'm not saying this to complain. But there's not, no matter how good the pastor is, and I don't claim to be a great one. I promise that I'm not claiming to be some kind of Superman. But it doesn't matter who the greatest pastor, who the greatest pastor in this country is or around the world is. They cannot do it by themselves. That's why God, when He describes His church, He says that we are many members in particular for us to have a local church, for us to have a church body, there has to be many uh, the separately doing their part and becoming one together to fulfill the mission of the local church. One cannot do it by themselves. Church, let me say, if you were one of those that reached in and you reached in the best you could and you reached in with all that you have, let, you, let me. Let, I want you to hear your pastor say thank you. Thank you for hearing the challenge. Thank you for not ignoring the message. Thank you for uh, doing Doing what I believe the Scripture teaches us to do. And if you were one of the ones that your hands had been into the ministry a little bit more than has been in 2022 and you backed off a little bit, that's okay. I'm not mad at you. But guess what the passing of a new year does? One year going to new year, it gives you an opportunity to say, I'm going to do this year what I did not do last year. I'm going to do more. You may be here and you reached in, but you said, I might could do a little bit more. I'd like to do a little bit more. The passing of a year gives you an opportunity to reach in a little bit more. Amen. Amen. God has blessed the efforts of our church by all of those that have taken the opportunity to reach in. And there's no doubt, and I'm telling you, there's no doubt in my mind by looking at how God blessed our church abundantly in 2022. There is no doubt in my mind that God will continue to bless, that our church will grow, and that its ministry will grow, and that there will be more that needs to be done this year than any other year that we've ever had. Can I tell you this morning, you can be a part in getting the task of the ministry of this church done for God's glory. Many have the idea that with a church our size that there may be less to do than in a larger church. But I tell you this morning, that could not be further from the truth. With a smaller church, there is more that needs to be done. And we need everyone to do their part. Amen. We're not the we're not, we're by, we are by no means the smallest church. I don't know how much y'all study statistics, but in, the, in 20, I about said 2022, in the year 2023, most church statistics don't even classify Beacon as a small church anymore. Most churches in America today are 50 people or less in membership. I'm not talking about attendance, I'm talking about membership. And there's most, now I don't do this, I don't understand doing this, but most churches, I've never understood a pastor that will say that we have 27,000 in our church membership and their building seats 4,000. <laughs> I've never understood that. We have, we have 500 in membership, but we had 60 on Sunday. We have 60 in our regular attendance. I've never understood that. In our bylaws here at Beacon Baptist Church, if you don't attend a church service in six months, you're automatically removed from the membership of our church. Because if you're, this church doesn't mean enough for you for you to even attend. And when I say not attend, if you are in, if you're like brother, if you're like like brother William, who's in a nursing home and can't get out, you're a shut in. We don't include those. Amen. 
We, we, don't, we don't include those that are not able to come. We do not include those that have sickness. We don't include those that are in rehab or something like that. We don't, <coughs> we don't I, uh, I, I, give, I give leniency uh, to our older folks to where it's hard for them to drive and it's hard for them to see. But I'll say this, those are not the folks we have to worry about when it comes to staying in church membership. Right. Because even the ones who can't drive at nine and can't see, they attend more than one service in six months. It's usually folks that are very able bodied and could be here but chose not to be here. They chose to rather be at the lake or be somewhere doing something else than being in the house of God. So therefore, you've got to have a standard somewhere. You've got to draw a line somewhere. And can I say, I taught this to the teenagers this morning. The, the ministry of local church is important. If this, if this is God's house and the Bible says wherever two or three are gathering in His name, I'm in the midst, that means when we come to church, amen, I, I don't need that page anyway, amen. <laughs> when we come to church, God was here before we got here. That's right. amen. Who am I to say I'm not going to show up to church when God decided He was going to show up? Church is important. Church is so important, God shows up on the premises. God wants to speak to us. God wants to work in our hearts. God wants to move in our hearts. You complain about what a bad week it's been, but you hadn't darkened the doors of the church for God to speak to you and bless you. That's where the problem is. And when you need help from God, don't run away from the church. Run to the house of God. Amen. Run to your Bibles. Run to prayer. Let God minister to you. Amen. But the, the, th the fact of the matter is, is when most people get in the hardest parts of their life, they don't run to their Bibles, to prayer, to church, to their pastor, to their leadership. No, they run away from all those things. And that's what they need the most. No doubt. Congregation, I'm telling you this morning, our church will need you in 2023 to be faithful to be faithful in your spot here to be faithful in your attendance to be faithful with the right attitude to be faithful uh, to come and to serve and to give uh, your heart to the things of God through the ministry of this church and you say preacher why are you harping so much on the church uh, you don't have to be a part of a church to be a Christian no you don't but I will say this everything God does in this world he does through the local church I told our teenagers this morning I told them, I said, we at Beacon Baptist Church, we don't support missionaries that don't have a pastor and don't have a home church. I'm not interested in supporting parachurch organizations. Every missionary we have, even though they may have started their own ministry, they do have a pastor and they do have a church. <laughs> they do have someone I could call and that has an authority over their life and is able to speak to them and give them leadership in their life. They're not rogue by themselves. When God does the work of missions, He does it through the church. That's why, that's why Jesus in Acts 1-8 told the apostles, And ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. God used those men that were originally, when they began, uh, that, when they began ministering all throughout the world, do you know what they did? The very first thing, they had that church in Jerusalem. They were sent out of the church in Jerusalem. Paul, the Apostle Paul was sent out of the church in, F, uh, the church in Antioch. Amen. Every church, every, even, even the preachers in the Bible had a church that they were ordained out of and sent by what God does in the world. He does through the local church. Amen. The Bible here is telling us we need to reach forth. But if we're going to reach forth, we've got to reach in. Church, thank you for doing that. And I'm telling you, I'm so thankful for what lies ahead. I don't know everything that God is going to let us see and experience this year. But I know it's going to be good. And I know it's going to be what God would have in church. I want you to be a part of it. Amen. What you can do. What God has put you here to do. You can do it. You have the abilities. You have the attributes to do it. If you assume someone else will do it, most likely it won't get done. I've learned that as a pastor. I pastor what the world, what the world would say is a smaller medium church now, which I'm thankful for that. I'm glad not to be a small church anymore. I'll take medium any day. <laughs> By the way, a, a church member that has vision for their church will not call this a small church. Amen. I never, never use the term small church when I talk about my church. 
I just say I'm thankful for our church. Not my little church, not my small church. I'm just thankful for our church. But, you know, I, th I think about as a pastor, one of the things that I've tried to do over the last several years is delegate tasks. And in five years, you learn who you can delegate to and who you can't. There's a whole lot of times that folks will say, oh, I thought somebody else was doing that. And we come in and it's not done. You know who the church, and I'm, I'm, I'm just talking for a minute. I'm not fussing, I'm just talking. You know who the church as a whole looks at is the one that dropped the ball on that? Uh -huh. Me. <laughs> you know who wasn't involved in it at all other than tasking you to do it? Me. There's been a whole lot of times others have dropped the ball and I've took it on the chin. Because I'm your leader, I put you in charge and I found out you might not have been the best person to put in charge. So you know what we do? We delegate to somebody else who will be more faithful. Look at me this morning. I want it to be you. Whoever you are, I want it to be you. You say, preacher, are you trying to give all your tasks away? No. But what I am doing is I'm trying to mobilize a church that will take their stand and take their part in this ministry. You'll be a part of something you believe in. If you're not a part, chances are you don't believe in what we're doing here. You will be a part. You'll be active in something you're excited about. If you're not active, chances are you're not very excited about what we're doing here. I'm excited about where God has called me to pastor and where God has called me to serve church. I'm excited who God has called me to serve alongside of. I love all of you. From the bottom of my heart, I love all of you. The reason why, why do I beat this dead horse? Because you need it in your life more than you even know. God has let me understand how much we as a church need it. And you may not see the importance, but friend, I do. And I want it for your life. The best joys I've ever, I ever had in my life was being a faithful part of my local church even before I became a pastor, even, even before anybody in the world knew my name or ever invited me to preach. I'm not here being faithful in this church just because God has called me to preach. Now I'm in this location because you called me to be your pastor. If it wasn't for Brother Caldwell's leadership and God leading him in my direction, I wouldn't have known you existed. You wouldn't have known I existed. I'd have had a better chance knowing about you than you would have known about me. I was a nobody when I came here. I'm still a nobody. You don't need to know who I am. That's not important. But I will say this this morning. God allowed me to serve in my local church. And because I, I, I gave this to the Sunday school class this morning too, I didn't, didn't prepare these at the same time, so it just worked out that way. <laughs> Dr. Lee Robertson made the statement, it takes three to thrive. Right. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night to be a thriving Christian. Right. I mentioned that to our Sunday school class. And you know, I found that out to be true in my own life. Resurrection Baptist Church, Calpin, South Carolina, the church that ordained me to send me out of that ministry. I was there Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Everything that was going on, I was there. And I'm telling you, some of the greatest days of my life, the greatest moments, the greatest experiences with God I had in that church underneath Pastor Joey Wampler's ministry, just being faithful and going to my pastor saying, Pastor, is there something I can do? Is there something you need? Is there some, some, something you've got on your heart that needs to be done around here that I can do? And just, just try to be involved, try to start new ministries, try to, just try to be active in anything. Amen. Whatever it is, reach in. If you do not do it, so the, the chances are, we'll, we think of it and say, well, if I don't do it, someone else will. It may not be that case. If you see a need, fill a need. 
If you see a need that needs to be met, meet the need yourself. God let you see the need because He had you in mind to be the one that would feel whatever the need is that needs to be met. He wanted you, as I just stated, to come to your pastor and say, Pastor, what do you think if I would do this for the church? Would that help? Does that go align with what you feel like the direction the church is going in? We need to reach in. And church, you have. Many of you have taken up that mantle and you've reached in and God blessed our church with one, uh, one historical moment after the next in 2022. Church, we still need to reach out. I mentioned this earlier in the announcement, in the, in the, the welcome part of the service. Here at Beacon Baptist Church, we support 62 missionaries every month. Have you ever taken the time to calculate what kind of a financial toll that is on our church every year? 62 missionaries, $100 a month, 12 months a year. This, not, not, not the church down, I'm talking about this church. That's five figures just in missionary funds. Yes, we still need to reach out even though we have 62 missionaries. Yes, we still need to reach out even though God has through the ministry especially of Dr. Thomas Caldwell, the pastor emeritus here and our founding pastor. He started it many years ago encouraging our church to be a church that passes out tracts and our church passes out hundreds if not thousands of gospel tracts and gospel literature in our community every year as an entire congregation. But yet we still need to reach out. We need to reach out even though our church, in addition to that missionary fund, spent over $100,000 in mission work this year. Let me tell you what some of, that, some, of, some of the things this church was able to do around the world for the cause of Christ this year. Not only did we build a church in Kenya, not only, and, and that is, bought the land, bought, built the building and pay the salary of the pastor. Still to this day we pay his salary. You provided mattresses for African pastors enrolled in Bible college trying to learn what they need to learn for the ministry. You provided 500 chairs for an evangelistic campaign in Malaba where many who sat in the seats that we purchased heard the gospel for the very first time and received a copy of God's Word for the very first time. I don't know about you, but I get emotional reading this. I'm telling you, we need to reach out and we've done it, but we need to do more. We need to reach forth. We sent a container of Bibles to Kenya and Uganda that contained, listen to these numbers, 25,652 whole King James Bibles, 23,400 King James New Testaments, 232, 232,000 God's Simple Plan of Salvation Gospel Tracts that will be distributed this very month among the 228 uh, IBOM churches, IBOM, the uh, International Baptist Outreach Mission, that particular mission board in Kenya and Uganda. Their churches, 228 of them, will receive those Bibles, will receive those tracts, as well as we have provided 1,466 Bible commentaries that this very month will be placed in the library of the Providence Baptist College in Malaba, Africa. You provided our missionaries with financial help that allowed them to purchase plane tickets into the number of thousands of dollars for plane tickets. Those plane tickets got them to their field. They're, they are preaching the gospel and having a service today because we paid the plane tickets to get them there. This church bought computers and printers for ministry use of our missionaries. We purchased a trailer to carry missionary supplies all over the country. We bought care packages that helped two missionary families that we don't even support be able to receive things for Christmas uh, to meet the families within their own congregations for Christmas through the ministry of Brother Stacy Piercy. We were able to take $10,000 and begin to uh, give the first amount of funds, uh, the, the one of the first groups of amount of funds to uh, start a kid's ranch in, in Panama to rescue abused children and to win them to Jesus Christ. 
Through our missions program alone, we have reached not only the United States in which there has been preaching of God's Word in men's homes, in children's homes, in nursing homes, in prisons, and in, in some of the most spiritually needy states in the Union. We've reached all across the United States with the message of the Gospel. We've reached Mexico, we've reached North Korea, we've reached South Korea, we've reached China, we've reached the Philippines, we've reached all throughout South Africa through several missionaries, all throughout the entire continent of Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Malaba, Malaba all throughout Southeast Asia. We were able just a couple of weeks ago to give uh, to Brother Chris Murray's campaign in Thailand to where they were able to give the gospel personally to over 5,000 people in Thailand and saw over 200 souls come to know Jesus as their Savior. We reached out to the Jewish community around the world through your missions dollars. We were able to reach in through two of our missionaries in one of the darkest countries in the world, Sri Lanka. We were able to reach into Brazil, Albania, India, Panama, Lebanon, Japan, Tinian, England, Wales, Vietnam, the Middle East, and Grenada, among many others. Yes, we were able to do all of that through our missions ministry, which we have emphasized here at Beacon as a way of reaching out to those that we may never meet this side of heaven. We've put thousands of Bibles into the hands of the lost through our offerings through Brother Bob Ford and Baron Precious Seed. Our congregation personally worked and served in the single largest ministry event ever to take place on this property in our soon to be 34 years as an organized church where we reached out to our community uh, in a very reasonable number of possibly uh, even into the thousands to where people came onto the property of this church, received a gospel tract, received a copy of the Word of God, uh, received an invitation to our church and saw a congregation loving them and their family families on purpose that's what the community this what that's what Lexington needs that's what our community needs is a church that will love them on purpose that will love them where they are if they've got piercings we love them if they've got tattoos we love them if they're dirty or stinky we love them if if they're not what and raised the way we are we love them if they didn't have the same background we love them we just love them to Jesus young uh, young small uh, big amen uh, old young we, we love them all amen and there's something for them here at Beacon Baptist Church. I want us to provide a place where the lost and even those in our own congregation can come in and find a loving community of believers who love Jesus and love people and will make this church the greatest place they'll go all week. That's why I put such an emphasis on our children's ministry. That's why we started the children's offering. Preachers, because you want more money? No, you give. I want these children to have, me have memories of doing something for God while they're young. That children's ministry, you know what it'll teach them? It'll teach them they don't have to be 30 to count for Jesus. They have a pastor that got saved at eight years old. I started preaching. God called me to preach at the same age. I've been preaching since I was eight years old. I've given my entire life to it. I've told you before, I've never regretted a moment, never regretted a day of serving Jesus. My only regret is I wish instead of eight years old, I'd have been like you, Mother Tommy, and got saved at five. My only regret is I didn't give more of my life to God. I wasn't as faithful as I should have been. I wasn't as holy as I should have been. I wasn't as uh, consecrated as I should have been. I just wish I could have given him more. <laughs> I want to teach these babies that they can give all of their life to Jesus at the youngest age. You say, preacher, but they're not even safe. That's okay. That'll come along. They're safe. They don't even know they're lost yet. They don't know how to be saved yet. I'll preach the Bible to them. We'll let these Sunday school teachers teach them about Jesus. You live the Christian life in front of them so you won't be the reason why they stumble and miss out on a life they could live for God. <laughs> Brother Dean, I have three babies. You know that. I have a six-year-old boy. <laughs> Tells me every week he wants to be a preacher. 
like his daddy. I don't want my life. God may not call him to preach, and I'm not going to force it on him. But I don't want my life to be a reason why he hates the ministry, why he hates church, why he hates preachers and preaching. Church, I don't want your life to change how these babies view church. As a church, my vision for our congregation is that when kids come into this church, yes, they may be loud, yes, they may be rowdy, but they'll find out that this is the greatest place on earth to be, with the greatest people on earth to be. And there may be people out there who hate them, but there's not anybody here who hates them. That's right. All three of my babies, my six-year-old son, my three-year-old son, and my one-year-old daughter, they cannot wait to get to church. That's right. They love it. It's their favorite place on earth to be. I have so many memories of getting up on Sunday mornings and telling my kids, all right, we're going to church. And they don't say, oh, I wish we could do this. I wish we could do that. Joey this morning told his mama he wanted to go to beach with daddy. I don't know what that means. <laughs> no mama, just daddy. <laughs> but when he found out we were going to church, when I came out of my office this morning from praying and looking over these verses and making sure my mind was where it needed to be for the morning service, my son came up to me and said, Daddy, we're going to church today. Yay! And he runs off. <laughs> I want my children to always say, yay, it's time to go to church. Amen. Because I know plenty of teenagers that have to be drug out of bed to go to church. That have to have mom and dad force them and fight them all the way to church just to be here. I don't want that atmosphere for our church. I don't want that attitude for our church. I want us to love not just the young. I want us to love the old. I want us to love the ones who may not be able to be here all the time, but we love them nonetheless because they're no less a part of our church. Brother William Gibson's no less a part of our church in the nursing home than he is when he's here, when, he, when he's able to be here every week. Miss Self, before she went to heaven, was no less a part of our church at home in a wheelchair, in a chair, than she was all those years that her and Pete, Brother Pete so faithfully walked in like clockwork every Sunday morning, every Sunday night. And Wednesday night. My first entrance into ministry, you'd think being a young pastor, my first entrance into ministry would have been around young people, but it wasn't. My heart for young people come from being a young person who didn't have a church that made much of them. I was a teenager before I had a, a church that even mentioned about, do you, would, would you like to do this? Yeah. Would you like to sing? Would you like to lead in prayer? From the day I walked into Resurrection Baptist Church, and it, it, well, we didn't even have our own church building then. We were meeting in an elementary school gymnasium. The moment I walked in, the, I, Brother Joey Wampler, beca who became my pastor a few months later, found out I was a preacher. And the very first thing he said is, would you like to lead in prayer over the offering, or in prayer over the service this evening? Hmm. I told him I'd be honored to. You say, preacher, why'd you stay? Because there was a church that saw a value in a young man. Didn't just put him to the side, but I, felt I found a place I could be a part of the ministry as a teenager. You know, I, like I said, you would thought that being, a young, being called to preach since eight years old, that I would have started out in youth ministry, but I didn't. I don't know anything about youth ministry. <laughs> Y'all found out in the last several years of me being the de facto youth pastor around here, I don't know a whole lot about youth ministry. <laughs> I know I love them, and that helps with a lot. But I wasn't trained in youth ministry. My first entrance into ministry at all in a, in a pastoral sense was nursing home ministry. You put me around a bunch of 80-year-old folks that are on medicine and falling asleep, and I can have a time in the pulpit. That's why y'all don't bother me a whole lot. I have, I have folks come to me all the time and say, Preacher, I, I worked all night long, and I apologize if you saw me doze off this morning. Doesn't bother me. Now I'm, not, now, I'm not telling you, everybody, make sure you take you a big dose of Benadryl before you come to church and just enjoy the comfy seat and take a nap. I'm not going to be that pastor and say, well, I'm glad I was able to provide you some good rest this morning. I'm not that kind. 
but it don't bother me. It's not going to stop me from preaching. I don't get distracted by that. I've told my wife, I said, the one person who can distract me the most in our church is her. If she gets up and starts doing something, I meet, I almost can't talk after that. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what's going on that I need my attention. Uh, and that, and then Brother Ben. Brother Ben can distract me if he comes out here because the one time I didn't pay attention to Ben, we had a tornado that I needed to know about. <laughs> so if Ben steps out, <laughs> I, know, I know I need to pay attention. I ain't going to preach through Ben's attempts to get a hold of my attention again. <laughs> I almost killed all of y'all that night. <laughs> Then y'all could literally say y'all were killed by preaching when you got to heaven. <laughs> but I love our young. I love our old. I love everybody in between. If we're the church that God wants us to be, then we, we should have that, that kind of love. Reaching in. Reaching out. Reaching forth. Don't, reaching forth in a nutshell means this. Now I'll preach the text tonight. Okay. Reaching forth means this. I preached the general truth of it this morning. <laughs> and I gave you an application. <laughs> if, you ain't, if, you had, if you hadn't applied it, you hadn't preached. Amen. That's what Brother Sam Kaminsky says. So I, want, I applied it this morning to our church. This morning's message in a nutshell is this. Yes, we're to reach in. Yes, we're to reach out. We can't afford to stop reaching in. We can't afford to stop reaching out. So how do you do it in a brand new year? You reach out, you reach forth. That's your reaching in, that's your reaching out, but you're doing it with an extension. That, that phrase, reach out, is one word in the Greek language, and it means to stretch. It means to, to try to go as far, you, you, you take yourself and you stretch it as far as you can. In your reaching out, you go as far as you can. In your, in your reaching in, you go as far as you can. Reaching out as far as you can, you give it everything that you've got. This year, we need to reach forth so that we can reach more before 2024. Every head bowed, every eye closed. My sins to forgive.